Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters Weekly Markets Checklist Week 133 and what a week it's been. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during your Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. What do we have this week, Keith? Well, first of all, thank you to everyone who turned up for the uh, Discord chat with rogue trader i thought it was very uh probably the best one we've done actually um very informative anyway news this week so the uk government has approved the development of the rosebank oil field in the north sea which is great news for common sense and as we import a lot of oil producing our own surely has a lower carbon footprint the field contains about 300 million barrels of uh, recoverable oil but but reminder the energy profits super levy of 75 percent remains in force until 2028 so we are unlikely to be attracting much investment into the north sea while that tax remains in place elsewhere chinese property stocks fell again after Evergrande raised doubts over its restructuring plan, according to the FT, the CEO and the CFO have been arrested. Bond yields had an awful, awful week and equities fell, although they've had a bit of recovery this afternoon. We're recording on Thursday night and the Nasdaq has entered correction territory, although which means it's down more than 10%, but I think it's bounced back out of that. And finally, oil prices have risen. Brent hit above 97, but has fallen back again slightly today. So this is the share price of China Evergrande. That is not a happy looking chart. Shares down 98.5% since the last five years. And they fell again this week. The U.S. national debt has surpassed 33 trillion. It was 32 trillion less than three months ago. Or if you have a look, view it another way. That does not look like a sustainable trend. Now, the markets have pushed back the date of the first expected Fed rate cut to July next year but they're still expecting the Fed to cut rates. The recent falls in bond yields have been in part caused by expectations that rates will stay higher for longer. But the speed of the bond sell-off has been absolutely astonishing. So the 30-year US Treasury has gained 1% in the past three months. Now, That represents significant monetary tightening. The odds of a US government shutdown are currently about 84%. So reminder, unless the US government, the Senate and the House of Representatives pass a bill to provide financing for the various departments, they will be forced to shut down on the 1st of October. And on to this week's economic data, Richard. Thank you, Keith. So the UK, the UK um, S&P Global Manufacturing PMI is is hovering around its low point, really. Certainly showing no signs of picking up. And uh, the services PMI is not looking very healthy. It looks as if it might be starting a bit more of a downtrend here. And um, it is below expectations. Yeah, that was quite a big miss. Yeah. And so the UK composite PMI is also down and below expectations. Yeah, that's the lowest this cycle. It is, isn't it? Lowest since COVID. Um, So the CBI industrial trends orders uh, is... uh, 
down around minus 20. So although expectation was met, expectation was pretty poor and performance is pretty poor. And the CBI distributive survey it was actually better than, it wasn't minus 40, which is pretty dreadful. And now it's only minus 20, so it's bounced up. But I would point out this, this is a really noisy chart. Yeah. And I think also we know that the uh, July retail sales were terrible, which probably led to um, a bad print in August. And then we know it bounced back with better weather in August, which probably led to a better September print. Yeah. And UK produ car production year on year, uh, it looks like it's going to start falling. I mean, I'd say that that has, um, doesn't look at all of a healthy chart. So it's fairly, I mean, it's stable between five and, and eight million cars. Um, sorry, 50 and 80,000 cars a month. Um, and now it's below 50,000 cars a month. It, it... Yeah. However, Richard, there was uh, some commentary, which I'm going to read out. After six straight months of growth, a decline in UK car output in what is always the smallest and most variable volume month is not a cause for concern. With car manufacturers taking advantage of the summer holiday to upgrade their plants, this is part of an ongoing commitment to deliver the next generation of electric vehicles with a record number of these models already being made. So they're saying that basically they closed the uh, factories in August to refit them. We <laughs> shall see. But you know, the other thing about this chart is, you know, we are currently producing half as many cars as we did pre-Brexit. And a third as many as we did pre-pre-Brexit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, this month, certainly. So, you know, the UK, UK economy looks like it's continuing to slow with interest rates staying high. Um, and the outlook for the UK economy doesn't look good. Thank you, Richard. On to the EU. So we also had EU PMIs, the manufacturing <laughs> PMI, deteriorated further against expectations of a small bounce. That is not a happy number. The services PMI was actually better than expected, but still in contraction territory in September. As a result of that, the composite bounced slightly, but remains well below 50. So the European economy continues to uh, contract and is not doing well. We then had the various EU surveys for the month of September. So this is economic sentiment, which beat expectations, but still deteriorated. So conditions, so sentiment did not deteriorate as much as expected, but still deteriorated. And EU industrial sentiment actually bounced slightly against expectations of further deterioration, but that is still not a happy number. Services sentiment deteriorated, but not as much as expected. Selling price expectations had a little bounce, but the bounce wasn't as high as expected. So that will not please the ECB. Consumer confidence deteriorated. Consumer inflation expectations bounced with the oil price. But now... Tomorrow, we have EU inflation numbers, as we have some preliminary data for Germany and Spain. And these are really good numbers. So German inflation fell from 6.1% in August to 4.5% in September. And reminder, that includes the oil price bounce. Core fell to 4.6% from 55 for core, that is an enormous drop. Producer prices, this is shocking. Producer prices year on year, minus 12.6%. That is strong deflation in finished goods. Spanish CPI, on the other hand, bounced to 3.5% on the back of rising energy prices. Core, actually, that is not a great number. 5.8%, still way too high. So EU summary, well, the PMI has actually bounced slightly in September, but remain in contraction territory. And 
The latest survey suggests the economy is slowing more gradually than expected, but it is still slowing. Reminder that monetary policy continues to tighten. Richard, US. So US global manufacturing PMI is hovering around about uh, just below 50. So it was marginally better than expectations. I would say that's within the margin of error. Well, people have been talking about a bounce in US manufacturing. That's not much of a bounce. No. And the, the uh, global US global services PMI is just around on 50. And that doesn't look... It's certainly not um, indicative of economy, uh, an economy that is growing. It's Neither is it contractionary, but it's definitely part of the trend that's been running since 2021 or the slowdown in the services sector. Yeah, in, within the range of service PMI prints, that is very much towards the low end. Yeah. So the median um, PMI services print is well above 50. And actually, sorry, Richard, I'm just going to read this out. Mm -hmm. um, the SP Global Services PMI fell to 50.2 in September from 50.5 in August, below expectations of 50.6. It was the slowest rise in business activity in the current eight-month series of growth. Service sector firms saw a solid decrease in new business, following pressure on customers' purchasing power from high inflation and interest rate hikes. A renewed fall in service sector new export orders led to another marginal decrease in total foreign client demand. However, the pace of increase in staffing numbers accelerated. This uh, chart shows that despite the falling new orders, um, the employment component of the S&P services PMI rose back to its long-term average. So that's another, we talked about this last week, bit of a contradictory um, or con contraindicating um, figure and the composite PMI bang on 50 really so is yeah. the US economy moving slowly into recession uh, US Chicago National Activity Index is um, down significantly down significantly worse than expectations and July was also revised downwards yeah now reminder that zero equates to average long-run growth. So what we're saying is the US economy is growing, but less than normal. The US Dallas Fed Manufacturing Index looking pretty unhealthy. Obviously, we've got the auto workers strike impacting there. And the Richmond Fed Manufacturing Index looking jolly healthy. Yeah, big bounce. Yeah. Uh, case Shiller house prices in debt, uh, prices month on month, uh, still rising, not as fast as previously, but still rising. And house prices year on year, well, ticked up a little bit. Yeah, mm. this is absolutely amazing, given that we know house price affordability in the US is at record lows. So the Case Shiller house price index compares the same houses being resold, but they the deals are reported when the transaction goes through and it can take up to three months between a deal being agreed and the legal documents and them being finalized etc so there is a bit of a lag here right uh, house price index month for month quite a steep climb much more than expectations um i mean we said consensus versus expectation better i'm not sure whether better is the right word but it's uh, certainly higher it depends whether you're a buyer or a seller i guess yeah the trouble is with this index so we had a, a discussion on the discord about this and thank you to wayne j is that when you look at the average price of houses with mortgages guaranteed the trouble is there's a set there's a bias here if you think that Actually, we know that only people with um, salaries above 100 grand now qualify for mortgages. There's a bias towards richer people. And therefore, the fact that the average house price guaranteed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac has gone up 
could be a selection bias because actually only rich people are now buying houses. And, you know, so you're cutting out the bottom quarter or half of the distribution. It doesn't mean that house prices are going up. And then we have the house price index year on year. So it's sort of stopped, stabilized at around about 5% at the moment. Mm, very high. Yeah. US new home sales, you know, following that upward trend, recent upward trend. Well, actually, Richard, it's I think this is the opposite. So August surprise drop. Well, so if you look at the slope of the, the line, Keith, it's noisy and it's moving up, it's moved up from 600 to 800 on that right hand scale. And I wouldn't have said that that trend has been broken. No, I agree with that. But, you know, month on month, actually a bit of a drop. And we know that, you know, mortgage prices have increased very sharply over August and September. So, you know, you're right. It's too early to declare a reversal of the trend. But that number fits my prejudices and expectations. Uh, US new home sales month on month, big drop in August. Uh, US durable goods, X defense month on month, um, almost neutral in fact, after a big drop in July. And US non defense capital good or goods orders, X aircraft. Yeah. <laughs> um uh, that's looking fairly healthy yeah these numbers are quite difficult to interpret because you know when you look at durable goods orders x defense it looks poor but then x defense x air it's it's pretty healthy so you know this is one i always say that something of why are we analyzing this data because we can why can't we because yeah we, it, <laughs> we had 20 years ago does it cynic? <laughs> yes. Does it mean anything? No, I don't think it does. Actually, not not with. I mean, look at this chart, basically from October twenty two till now. You think, well, what does it actually mean? Well, I think you know, durable goods orders are a key uh, component of the economy, and you know, tells you whether people are still right. willing to invest. And they are, but my point, I guess, Keith, is that interpreting this chart is actually yeah. really difficult. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, U.S. pending home sales month on month, a big, big drop. Uh, year on year, you know, we're down. Looks like that uptick from minus 40 to minus 20 may be changing, or it may not be. And U.S. GDP quarter on quarter growth annualized 2.1%. Corporate profits quarter on quarter holding up pretty strongly, actually. Well, massively below expectations, though. And, you know, if you look at it so far this year, pretty poor. Mm. Stock market's done all right. Oh, I wouldn't say they're pretty, pretty poor, Keith. I mean, you know, they're a little bit down on last year. Yeah, but the stock market's up. Yeah, the stock market's up, but we're expecting the economy to go into recession. Mm. Uh, real consumer spending quarter on quarter just growing a little bit, 0.8%. And uh, PC inflation quarter on quarter annualized, continuing to fall now, not far off 2%, which is the Fed's target. Yeah, that's in Q2. Yeah. Um, and annualized 4%, but clearly um, the, uh, the rate of inflation is continuing to fall. Yeah, this is, this is core. So I think what was... The two charts are saying is that Q2 was slightly flattered by falling energy prices. Yeah. And consumer confidence uh, in the US is continuing to gently rise, I would say. It also has gone down in the month, but it's annoying, you know, it's not with it's within the noise parameters yeah. line, isn't it? I'd agree with that. I mean in 2009 it hit 25. So, you know, compared to that. Fantastic. Uh, Red Book retail sales, 4%. Yeah, bounced. And uh, 30 year mortgage rate continuing to climb up, heading towards 8%. Mortgage market index doesn't really like that. And it looks to me like that's possibly going to drop further now. Initial jobless claims, the employment market seems to be firing on all cylinders. 
and continuing jobless claims in the employment market seems to be pretty stable. Yeah, so I think what it's the two um, charts are saying is that actually firms aren't letting people go, but people who are out of a job are finding it difficult to find new jobs. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, good, a good summary, Keith. So US economy does appear to be growing, slowing uh, gradually with the higher interest rates impacting. And uh, as Keith just said, labour hoarding uh, is is continuing. The latest PMI data suggests the US economy is slowing, manufacturing activity about service, service activity weakened, composite at 50 and a little bit. And uh, US housing sales slowing, so do appear to be continuing to slow, and uh, even though prices are going up. Yeah. No new data on China this week. Thank you, Richard. On to one chart. Now, this is the S&P earnings yield minus the three-month Treasury yield. And you can see that the cash yield is now higher than the earnings yield of the S&P 500. Now, what's interesting is that this tends to dip just before a recession. If you look at 2000, um, is that 1987? Yeah. And 2007 so what they're saying is that equities are overvalued compared to cash household wealth now very briefly the fed produced this chart of u.s household wealth uh this week and what it shows is that household wealth collapsed after the great financial crisis and then on the back of very low interest rates and qe it grew very substantially pre-pandemic shot up during the pandemic and has started growing again now that is a function of house prices and the equity market and you would expect as interest rates rise, house prices and the equity market to fall, but they have not done so. So household wealth is currently very high compared to uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And briefly on to the employee retention tax credit. Now, this is something I was unaware of, but this was a program by the US government to incentivize small businesses in the US to retain clients, to, to sorry, to retain employees during the pandemic. But as you can see from the chart at the bottom, it has mainly been paying out over the last couple of years, and in particular this year. So in this fiscal year, it's estimated around 220 billion has been dis, uh, dispersed and that you know supports small businesses and adds to the fiscal deficit but the irs is concerned about just the sheer number number of claims being processed and it has now stopped processing any new claims until the end of the year so that little wheeze that has supported u.s small businesses is over for now and on to credit crisis watch richard so the um, s p regional bank etf is fading again so we'll remember silicon valley bank and the other three big banks that um, needed to be rescued um Early on this year, the ETF has climbed uh, back up from like mid 30s to nearly 50. Now it's falling back down, and it would be highly surprising if none of the regional banks had problems similar to Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, US bank credit fell by half a percent year on year in the week to the 13th of September, which is a lot and suggests that. Uh, well, indicates that bank lending is declining quite quickly, which is a real drag on the economy. 
What's that? What does SLOOS stand for, Keith? Senior Loan Officers Survey. So credit growth follows the Senior Loan Officers Survey with a 12-month lag. So this chart puts that lag in place. So I'm looking at the left-hand chart, left-hand scale, sorry. The index is going to go seriously negative. Yeah. So tightening loan standards, inverted chart on the right, equals yeah. falling loan growth. And actually, I should say that the additional O is origination. So senior loan origination officer survey. So that's bad news for the US economy. Loans and leases grew by 4.4% uh, over that period. Um, but they may have grown by 4.4%, but that's relatively low in comparison to the data on this chart. And apart from a few um, recessionary periods, it is at the low point, I would say, for a non-recessionary period. Mm. 12 months change in credit flows is negative. 2.8%, which is uh, should sort of suggest the economy is slowing down, will slow the economy down. Yeah, that's the credit impulse, as calculated by Portfolio Matters. Well done, Keith. Thank you. Uh, and almost 700 banks exceed the 2006 um, CRE loan concentration guidance, which means they're very exposed to particular sectors, I'm guessing the sector would be commercial property. Yes. The the sector we know is in a lot of trouble. Yeah. China, China Evergrande. <laughs> <laughs> um, San Francisco office vacancy rate has hit a new high. Um, that's the green line. And uh, that is um, 32%. I mean, I don't know what they model there. Um, do their financial models have, but it's not going to be at a 32% vacancy rate. They probably do it so like a 20% vacancy rate. I suspect yeah. they're all significantly underwater now. Yeah. So when we talk about commercial real estate, any loans secured on San Francisco office properties are going to be deep underwater. I guess it's an office block deep underwater. Yep. 62% less than its price in 2014. Yeah. So a decade ago, you know, your return over a decade is minus 62%. Not great. So the caption on this, uh, we don't call them tweets anymore, do we, Keith? We have to call them X's. <laughs> so the caption on this X is uh, Nashville's luxury apartment alcove and sister building, Prime. 700 units have 186 million construction loan, uh, at, um, which is 15 million interest per year which is 18, they've calculated this to be $1,800 per month per unit interest payments, uh, which is, you know, which is a lot, isn't it? Well, basically, basically what you're saying is that, you know, these big uh, residential apartments, you can't finance them. Uh, so they're these interest rates. So they're all being built on cheap money, you know, from back when interest rates were low. But now, once these are finished, the developer has a problem if he needs to refinance them, but also nobody's going to be building any new ones. Nobody's going to be buying them. Whether they buy them or lease them, I don't know. Mm. I mean, the, the residents. Bank of America have been slashing the ratings of um, collateralized mortgage-backed securities. So the last time this happened was in 2008, roughly. And we haven't got 2008 here, but clearly we can see that there's a, st a steep climb in the um, in the rate in the rating, or I guess a steep climb in the. So yeah, I mean the U.S. banking crisis has definitely not gone away. It's been suppressed over the summer by the Fed. Um, so the, the small banks have still got funding profitability stresses. They've got a lot of exposure to commercial real estate. A lot of those loans um, will be non-performing. And the developers will go into liquidation almost certainly. And that's going to really not only will they have losses on their income portfolios, but they're going to have losses, significant losses on their commercial real estate portfolios. It's going to get it's going to get messy, Keith. I think it is. But so far, it hasn't done. I mean, it's just been amazing. I, You know, we showed earlier U.S. house prices absolutely mystifying. 
So what I would say there is, I think it was probably a year and a half ago, we were saying, well, yeah, we were saying China Evergrande is toast. <laughs> and China Evergrande appeared to rise like a phoenix from the ashes, mm. only to turn into toast. Yes. But it took longer than we thought. This is going to take longer than we think. But yeah. I don't think, you know, I think this is inevitable. Yeah, well, I agree with you. Thank you, Richard. Well, on to the basis trade. What is it? Why is it potentially dangerous? Now, you may be aware that hedge funds have built up an enormous short position in U.S. treasuries. But they're not naked short. They built up those positions as a part of the basis trade. So what is the basis trade? Well, the basis trade basically looks to arbitrage tiny pricing discrepancies between the price of treasury futures and the price of the underlying bonds. So the FT had a series of graphics basically explaining how this works. So your hedge fund goes and buys a US treasury bond. It then goes to its prime broker, takes a loan out for the value of the bond and deposits the bond as collateral. OK, so it now has cash, but it also still has the bond with its prime broker. They sell, then sell a future based on the bond in the market and they make money if there's a price discrepancy in their favor between the future they've sold and the price at which they bought the bond. So this is fine as they are hedged. And, but the trouble is that they do this in enormous size because basically <clears throat> the prime broker will allow them to leverage this trade 50 times. In fact, leverage of 200 is not unheard of. And some hedge funds have been known to leverage themselves up to 500 times. So although the pricing discrepancy between the bond and the future is tiny, they are very highly leveraged. And if there is a discrepancy in the market, a market dislocation of any kind, this can go horribly wrong. Now, long term long term capital management springs to mind precisely and if all goes well when the futures expires the price of the future converges with the price of the bond they close out their tiny profit and all is well now what can go wrong well if the banks decide that the hedge funds are over leveraged they have to reduce the size of their trade or stump up more collateral. If the clearing houses increase their collateral requirements, the same. Or if repo rates increase, then the profitability of the trade falls. Now, all of that reduces the profitability of the trade and may lead to forced unwinding. Now, because of just sheer size of these positions, the fear is that this would lead to hedge funds trying to sell vast amount of treasuries in the market in which they are key participants and also trying to buy back loads of futures. And that could lead to a fall in liquidity. And if you remember back to March 2020, the treasury market completely seizing up. So it's not that this would cause treasury bonds to completely collapse. It's just liquidity could completely die. Which is not another risk here. Maybe I've misunderstood it. Which is, if there becomes a significant discrepancy between the price of the future and the price of the bond, then they're exposed to that discrepancy. That's true. That is true. Yes. So a large move the wrong way in but, the price of the yeah, future. but presumably. There's um, lots of people arbitraging those differences. So any discrepancy between the future and the bond would just lead to other people coming in to arbitrage that discrepancy, you would hope. Yeah. On to inflation watch, Richard. Thank you, Keith. So 
data this month. Um, Germany, uh, CPI 4.5% in September falling and uh, core CPI 4.6% falling. And in Japan, we had 3.2% um, in August, which is falling and 3.1% in all uh, uh, for core CPI. So uh, no other data, no inflation data of the UK, US or EU is there, Keith, yet. No. I think we're waiting that imminently. Yeah. The FOMC next meets on the 31st of October and the Bank of England on the 2nd of November and the ECB is the closest one meeting on the 10th of December where we might get a change in the ECB interest rate. I doubt that very much. I think they're done. Yeah, you're probably right. US true inflation has stopped falling at 2.6%. Smack yeah, on. that's a good number though. You know, there's very little inflation in the US, really. Yeah, yeah there, there is. I mean, whether that is, uh, I always, you know, inflation doesn't just go up and down and then stay. It, historically, it goes in waves. Uh, yeah. We have to be careful that we don't count on chickens and that there isn't another wave of inflation in the office. I do think that the recent oil price rise probably hasn't really fed through yet into the, uh, into the economy properly. That's true, but pump prices will be in those numbers. They will be, yeah. And UK true inflation is at that super low level of 9%. Yeah. You see, I'm in the US, I'm more comfortable about the true inflation numbers than yeah. the UK. I actually had to dig around in the underlying data they use. Yeah. And they're showing a big jump in you know, hotel and hospitality inflation in the UK, jumped 10% in September. And I just don't think that's right. This is very, you know, the huge spikes up and down in this data series, suggesting yeah, we have a very limited sample. That's so true, Keith. That's a good point. So the US CPI shelter continues to cause headline. Basically, shelter is lagging. So um, as we discussed last week, if so, if, they, if shelter was a contemporaneous figure, uh, inflation would have been much higher to start with and would be much lower now. Yeah. Rental inflation appears to have peaked 18 months ago and is still declining, according to the Zillow Rental Index. And uh, if you substitute current rental price inflation of 1% uh, into the CPI for shelter, then we get a CPI figure of 1.5%, not even 2 point, whatever it yeah. is, 0.6%. So... Um, you know, the CPI does appear to be overstating the US CPI. Sorry, shelter does appear to be overstating US CPI still. Yeah. So actually, if you use market data instead of CPI shelter, you know, there's no inflation in the US. The inflation is really low. Yeah. So, you know, this big bond sell off and everyone's saying it's about concerns about inflation. I just don't think that's true. More on that later. Mm. So... The U.S. extends temporary protection to nearly 500,000 migrants. I, I do find the uh, Biden administration's sort of laissez-faire attitude to the ways of immigration from Southern America difficult to understand. Yeah, well, they've just basically allowed 472,000 uh, illegal Venezuelan immigrants to uh, get work permits, basically. So, you know, frankly, that seems like that solves part of their uh, tight labour market in one go, doesn't it? Well, it does, yeah. I suspect a lot of them are working illegally anyway, but, you know... I it's got a social unrest, though, doesn't it? Mm. I think that's the, one of the problems. Well, exactly. You know, the Republicans are saying that, you know, you just provided a huge incentive for the rest of Venezuela to come in as well. Yeah. So the Atlanta Fed wage growth tracker fell to 5.7% in August. So that's slowly following inflation down now. Still way too high, but coming down. Yeah. And the bond market, which continues to sell, is uh, worried about persistent inflation. But the data does suggest that inflation is low and not far off one way or the other, the 2% target. Yeah, I mean, the other thing the bond market may be worried about is going back to the chart you showed right at the beginning, Keith, with that enormous 
red US debt may actually be worried about that. Yeah. Well, we've got a whole discussion coming up on that, Richard, and um, I'd appreciate your thoughts, frankly. OK, and on to recession watch. So the yield curve inversion appears to have peaked. And if you look at the gray bars, the gray vertical bars, which indicate recessions, that generally marks the start of uh, the imminent start of recession. So. A yield curve inversion predicts a future recession. When the inversion has peaked, that tends to indicate it's getting close. Bankruptcy rates are rising still. And if you look at the non-farm payrolls, well, this chart shows the percentage of non-farm payrolls, which is government jobs. And you can see that in 2023, almost 20 percent of new net new jobs growth is from the government. So the payroll numbers, which are we know are fading, have been supported by an increase in government payrolls. But if you step back and look at the bigger picture, well, actually, the federal government's total payroll hasn't grown much in 50 years, which is astonishing given the rise in the population over that period. And we showed you earlier the S&P Global Services PMI. Well, if you look at the new business component, well, new orders are dropping sharply. And... We know that small businesses, unlike the S&P 500, have seen a sharp rise in the interest they have to pay on their loans. And that is a big number, 9%. Now, last week we talked about household savings, and this is JP Morgan. They estimate that U.S. household savings were exhausted by June. And the Fed this week was talking about the distribution of household savings. And you can see here, they think that only the top 20% of the population still have excess savings from the pandemic. Now, turning to the UK, talking this week to... A friend of ours, actually, who has a uh, mortgage comes up for refinancing on the 1st of October. And he currently has 2%. If he went on to the bank standard variable rate, he would go on to 8%. And this is the number of UK households that will refinance to higher rates. So in the coming quarters, you have a lot of households. Now, we've talked previously about the lags inherent in uh, rising interest rates. And here you can see that the longer interest rates remain high, the bigger a drag on the economy it will be. All these households will face much higher mortgage payments and that will reduce their discretionary spending. Now, turning to the Eurozone, we had lending numbers for August, not good. The light line is the raw monthly data. You'll see big net reduction in uh, loans to non-financial corporations. But part of that appears to be due to manufacturers reducing their inventories and they need short-term loans to fund inventories and stock and by reducing their inventories they've reduced their need for loans but that's still not great frankly it suggests that there's a reduction in activity in the manufacturing sector the lending for house purchases negative so net the eu is repaying its mortgages more than it's uh, taking out new ones not good for the construction sector. And 
we talked previously about deposit flight in the US. Well, in the EU, it's even worse. The black line is EU area deposits year on year. That's almost minus 10%. Shocking. You have to think that Eurozone banks have been very slow to pass on interest rate rises. And so everyone's taking their money out and sticking it elsewhere. And they put it in longer term savings account. So up to two years. So um, fixed term deposits. And that means fixed term deposits are not included in M1. And M1 has therefore been falling sharply. The dashed line is M1, and it's quite well correlated with GDP, he says. Although I wonder whether this is a chart crime. But anyway, um, turning to the PMIs around the world, you can see the manufacturing PMIs, which is the blue line, look terrible everywhere. And the services PMIs are turning down, particularly in Germany and the UK. Although the latest US print is not great either. This is global trade and it's falling at its fastest pace since the pandemic. So not a healthy indicator of global goods volumes. And this is the raw index. And you can see that it peaked in September 22 and has been falling ever since. Now, Oxford economics estimate that the world economy is already in recession and they they define a recession as less than 2% growth. Take a look. If we do have a recession, they tend to last, on average, between 10 and 12 months. So in summary, all the latest data is consistent with a global economy that is slowing towards recession. We have rising real interest rates and a negative credit impulse all around the world. Um, and on to U.S. construction activity. We have talked previously about the big surge in um, U.S. manufacturing construction. And this chart shows that it is almost entirely due to the electronics industry. Reminder, during the pandemic, most of the U.S. manufacturing suffered from supply chain disruption in the form of not being able to source the chips they needed from Taiwan. And so that has le led to a huge surge in reshoring activity. And if you exclude the electronics industry, you get not much. So that surge in construction activity is very much uh, linked to semiconductors and is likely to be a one-off rather than ongoing. Mm. Soft landing watch, Richard. So uh, default rate on leverage loans, aka junk bonds, is um, continues to be low. Actually, I think they're slightly different from the junk are they? bonds. Yeah, I think they are. Anyway, anyway, they are they're vulnerable loans. The loans that are most vulnerable to default. When the going gets tough and the default rate is low, so yeah, um, the um, companies are only more interest than they're paying out uh, because of the, uh, the fact that they can get more money on their deposits. Yeah, I was amazed. And they've this got is... fixed rate, fixed rate loan, fixed fixed rate borrowing at very low rates. Yeah, but so much depends on the distribution. Yeah. And uh, so it's a chart that shows the uh, interest expense and interest income for Microsoft. And you can see that they're making a packet. Yeah. Well, so the thing is, we know the S&P 500 companies have locked in their uh, loans at very low interest rates and are therefore benefiting from higher um, deposit rates. But we also know, because we showed you the chart earlier, that small businesses are suffering much higher um interest rates on their loans so i suspect that it's the big companies that are responsible for this surge in net yeah. interest and the small companies are suffering probably right actually 
And um, as Keith just said, this suggests that small, the smallest companies are actually paying significantly increased effective interest rates. The Citigroup Economic Surprise Index remains surprisingly strong. And uh, the US cycle indicators are flattened, but are still rising. So the leading economic indicators are falling away. The cyclical economic indicators stop rising. And the aggregate economy economic indicator coincidence index is actually continuing to rise quite sharply. Yeah. So everyone thinks it'll be a soft landing. Number of Wall Street Journal articles that reference a soft landing. Um, there we are, very high. <laughs> soft landing calls that have preceded past recessions. So there we go. So the more soft landing calls you get, the more likely you are to have a recession. Mm. It's, uh, I like that. And Goldman are forecasting no recession with the economy bottoming in Q4. So, I mean, the, the consensus is a soft landing. I don't really rate the consensus, uh, but I do think the data is very hard to interpret. And um, I think it rather depends on what the Fed does with interest rates now. On to other charts. So Chinese households and businesses are showing great caution. So they're reluctant to spend and invest. Obviously, the Chinese economy is in some difficulty. So everybody is drawing in their, hor their horns a bit, which, of course, helps the Chinese economy to slow down a bit more. Yep. And there's a rise in office vacancies, which is actually quite substantial. It basically doubled since 2010. Um, and that clearly is not going to be helping the property market either. I wonder whether they have the same home, working from home uh, culture that we have developed since the pandemic. I'm not sure. Do you think they're just overbuilt? It looks like, doesn't it? Because this has been going on for, for a long time. And China's... Uh, Total return, uh, real estate total return index is not looking very healthy. Is something brewing in the um, Chinese real estate market? Well, I would say quite possibly yes. Mm. I mean, it's, it's imploding, isn't it? Yeah. And here we have Trump is now the favourite to be the next president of the USA. Shocking. Extraordinary. It is quite extraordinary. And okay, so we have oil and gas. UK total UK total energy consumption is down twenty eight percent since two thousand uh, due to increased energy efficiency, like double glazing, for example, and the loss of heavy industry, presumably such as steel manufacturing. Yeah, but, I found well, this just absolutely amazing, though. Yeah. Down twenty eight percent. That is a huge number. It is a lot, isn't it? Um, I mean, you can see that um, houses are more energy efficient now, insulation. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what's really, um, what for me, what really stands out of this is, is that fossil fuels still makes up well, 80% or something, doesn't it? And yeah. nuclear power is, is tiny. Yeah. And bioenergy and waste, presumably most of that is Drax importing chop, importing chipped Amazon rainforest. <laughs> yes. It's sustainable as long as there's a rainforest left for you to chop down, which should be it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and on to good news. Well, we talked about this before, but, you know, and how we're, we're, Every week we've been showing you the lithium price, which had that absolutely extraordinary spike in uh, 2021, has been, since been drifting off. And we've been commenting that the thing is, lithium is actually not that rare in the Earth's crust. It's just previously we hadn't really had a use for it, so we haven't been looking for it. And we previously reported a massive lithium deposit that had been found in Kashmir, 5.9 million tons. Well, They've now found an even bigger one in Nevada, and it contains an estimated 40 million tons of lithium. That is 13 million tons more than all the other known lithium deposits in the world. And can I just point out this rather beautiful picture it contains 15 endangered species? Yes, 
but you know lithium is necessary to save the planet richard so you know we can wipe out a few endangered species i'm sure so uh mine is expected in 2026 and this is good news you're not meant to point that out you know gosh that's not long is it yeah so anyway uh, the lithium price is toast basically it's not going to go anywhere near its uh previous peak mm. and on to equities richard thank you keith so the FTSE all world equity index down 0.9 percent on the week and up uh, 8.2 percent it's had basically this summer has been a pretty poor period for the equity indices i think people who have Got used, I started to get used to the idea that interest rates may be higher for longer. Mm. And the FTSE all share down 1.3% for the week um, and up 1.1% for the year. So pretty much unchanged on the year now. The Euro stocks 600 down 1.3% for the week, uh, up 56 for the year, but it's been flat effectively since May. And the SP 500 down uh, a little bit. 0.3% on the week, 12, up 12.4% for the year to date, still. So it's a good year still for the S&P 500. Sorry. And the NASDAQ, up a magnificent 27% year to date and up 0.3% for the week. There's the Russell 2000, which is probably more reflective of the bulk of the US economy, which is only up 2.2% for the year and had a, a little bump up this week but significantly down during the course of the summer. And Hang Seng, basically following a rather gentle path downwards uh, without deviation and uh, down 3% nearly for the week and 12% for the year to date. Yeah, not doesn't say encouraging things about the Chinese economy, actually. Doesn't, does it? Not at all. And there's the topics... It's actually done pretty well, up 24% for the year, which presumably part of that is to do with the fact that the, the, the yen has uh, been hammered. I think it's all to do with the yen being hammered, frankly. Yeah. Now, Bitcoin uh, hasn't really moved, has it, since March, although it's up 64% in the year. And the British pound is um, not looking really particularly good against the US dollar. Uh, yeah. Pretty much unchanged year to date. In a rather nasty downtrend since July, as is the euro. Yeah, both the UK and European economies are clearly slowing a lot more than the US is. Yeah. And that tends to mean that they will um, not be raising rates and maybe cutting them earlier. So that tends to you know, undermine support for the currencies. Yeah, yeah indeed. And there's the dollar index, which is sort of the inverse of the pound and the, and the euro particularly in versus the euro. And the VIX will spiked up, but is now falling back down. Amazing. Absolutely amazing how low the VIX is. Yeah. And the fear and greed index, we are quite fearful, but not extremely fearful. Yeah. And less, fewer than 14% of the S&P 500 companies trading above their 50-day moving average which is a low for the year. And uh, that's in, I mean, that basically shows that most of the S&P 500 companies aren't doing that well, but the usual suspects are supporting the S&P 500. Yeah. And the AIM share index is down 45%. Wow, I didn't know that from its uh, 2021 high. I mean, AIM looks to be dying a death, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? Now, I was absolutely shocked by that. Yeah. Uh, the NASDAQ has entered correction territory as defined by correction. Yeah, down 10%. It's had a bounce today, though. Yeah. And the real bond yield versus the S&P 500 forward priced earnings uh, is uh, there's, the gap actually is, continu is the gap continuing to widen or is it has it been stable over the last few weeks? No, it's continued to widen. Yeah, it's continuing to widen, isn't it? So that suggests the S&P 500 should be dropping yeah or tip shields should be falling yeah but there's a disconnect there which has to close at some stage yeah and uh, the sp 500 x the top seven as we just discussed it's pretty much flat on the year 
which is much more like what one would expect given the interest rate yeah. environment. So the ISM composite PMI uh, is falling, as we've discussed, and uh, that should equate to falling corporate profits. But corporate profits have not been falling as much as you might expect from the quite long-term chart that you see here. And yeah. the question is, is this because inflation has actually buoyed profits and given companies more pricing power? Peloton doesn't have much pricing power. I suspect there's a lot of Peloton devices available on the second-hand market. I actually haven't searched yeah. eBay for Peloton, but I suspect you can find an awful lot of them. And uh, Peloton was a fad. Yeah. Epic proportions. Yeah, I mean, it almost looks as bad as China Evergrande, doesn't it? Well, it's just amazing. It had a market cap of forty-nine billion in the pandemic. I mean, frankly, it's still got a market cap of one point seven. That seems, to my mind, it's probably at least double overvalued. <laughs> well, I mean, it was absurd, wasn't it? Mm. Didn't they have to supply, you know, like sixteen rowing machines to every human being on the planet to justify their market cap? Yeah. No, this is interesting. So this is. Like a, the, the the mass at the top here is iPhone prices, okay? And so this blue rectangle is the prices of the current a batch of iPhones. So, you know, your most expensive iPhone is that $1,600. And the thick black line here is the price of Android phones. And so the price of Android phones has been falling. But Apple have managed to maintain the price of their uh, iPhones. And how long is that sustainable? When I was a student, I did a business course in which we had to role play um, developing and selling a new widget. And what we discovered was that the... Um, Initially, we had pricing power, okay, and we made extraordinary profits by not producing very many of them at a very high price. But then another team started investing in new production, increasing production, and eventually they produced vastly more than we did at half the price, and our profits went from very high when theirs had been low to zero and their profits went through the roof. So I wonder whether it's just a question of time before Apple finds its pricing power is eroded. In which case, Keith, it will simply have to sit on its cash balance and earn a tidy little sum. <laughs> yes, that's true, Richard. Now, before we move on, we're showing that chart earlier of... Goldman Sachs' um, forecast for the U.S. economy. And we know, we talked about previous weeks, how um, everyone is expecting earnings to keep rising. But I would observe that we know activity, as measured by the PMIs, is slowing, that the U.S. dollar is rising, which is very bad for exports, and interest rates are rising. And with a lag for large companies, but immediately for small companies, that will reduce profits. So I just don't see how companies can keep growing profits to the extent of what is the expectation of 12% next year is the consensus. Yeah. And at some stage, you think that fantasy mm -hmm. collides with reality, but it hasn't happened so far. No, I agree with you, Keith. Okay, and on to commodities and energy commodities. And it was another big week for the oil market, up another 2.5%. Brent peaked above $97 this week. And as at the London close today, it was at 95.8. WTI also had a good week, up at 2.4%. $92.4. That's a big rise over the last three months. Some data specific to the oil market. Well, the puzzle over the last couple of weeks is we've actually had builds in the US. And this week we had a small draw. So everyone is saying that the uh, oil market is in 
big deficit, but we're not really seeing that in the U.S. inventory numbers. U.S. crude continued at its uh, high for the year, 12.9 million barrels a day. Baker Hughes rig count fell by eight, despite the high oil prices. Now, so while we talk about oil, so this is the EIA's forecast for world supply and demand over the next three years. The red line is demand. The blue line is supply. And you see they are forecasting that we're going to have now an extended period of excess demand. That could mean high oil prices for a while. We showed you this last week, but to reminder, Bloomberg are forecasting a deficit of over 3 million barrels a day in Q4. That is a lot. But US economy is a lot less oil intensive than it was. So I'm not sure this is a very good metric, frankly, but this is the average gasoline price divided by disposable income. <clears throat> and it shows that gasoline price as a percentage of income is much lower than it was. And we know that the reason the oil market is so tight is because Saudi Arabia and Russia have been taking supply out of the market. And you can see that in the seaborne exports of medium and heavy sour which have been declining. That is Saudi cutting exports. Moving on to China, Chinese um, imports have actually grown a lot over the last year as a result of China reopening from a low base. But I thought this was very interesting. The head of China's National Offshore Oil Company has warned that Chinese oil consumption may peak later this year. The EIA disagrees, and I think that's optimistic. They're saying it could uh, it peak towards the end of the decade. But the latest um, car sales are that EV penetration in China is now about 37%. So, actually the transition to electric vehicles is happening much faster than certainly I expected. You mean being reflected in the burning of coal? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> burning loads of coal. That's the eco-friendly solution, Richard. I know. The um, Now, this is the oil futures curve. This is not encouraging. So the oil futures curve is in deep backwardation. So what that's saying is, the futures price is much higher than the current price. So it's trying to encourage people to put oil into storage because they expect the price to be higher later. And this shows the spare capacity for OPEC plus Russia and over 4 million barrels a day. So the tightness of this market is entirely political. It is OPEC and Russia making taking advantage of their pricing power to squeeze the oil price higher. And to me, this just shows the uh, relative lack of influence of the US and it's Saudi showing that they um, have an independent policy now and can tell the US to naff off. So moving on to natural gas, well, we're now moving into October and we're starting to use gas. So the gas price rose by 5% in Europe and by 4% in the UK. In the US, it rose by 12%. Is that right? Doesn't look like it. Anyway. It rose to 2.94. Um, the coal price was pretty flat. I thought this is a really good graphic, actually. Pause, take a look. This is the volume in cubes of all the fossil fuels bought, uh, burnt by humanity in one year. That down there 
is the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world, which is an astonishing 830 metres high, to put things in perspective. And frankly, I've, I think it's going to be very difficult to wean ourselves off crude oil, particularly for long haul freight. Um, and we just got to get rid of coal. If we can get rid of coal, we get a long way towards net zero. And this is uranium, which is off to the races. $70 a pound. Richard will be happy. And industrial metals, Richard. Uh, so aluminium. I mean, one would expect industrial metals to be hit, being hit by the slowdown in the Chinese economy um, as a sort of principle. So aluminium is up. Cobalt unchanged again. Copper is down. Yeah, that's not looking a happy trend, actually. No, it's not, is it? And uh, copper futures in deep contango, which is the opposite of the oil, but oil futures. Mm. Uh, price weakness ahead, which is what you would expect from the, the drop off in demand, and the, the presumably is not coming from the Chinese property market, property construction. Uh, chromium is. Um, it's a, well, it's a funny chart to interpret chromium, isn't it? Yeah, going nowhere. Yeah. Iron ore is moving down a bit at the moment. And there's the price of lithium, which is falling steadily. Yeah. And when they kill all those rare flowers in Nevada, Richard, yeah. it's going to go through the floor. There's a uh, neodymium. Which is I'm saying, now I would expect the price of neodymium to be affected by the slowdown in construction of wind farms mm. that we're hearing about because the governments aren't prepared to subsidise them sufficiently. So we'll watch this space. Yeah, but also um, with the uh, interest rates going through the roof, you know, big infrastructure like projects like that, which require a lot of funding, just become economic. Yeah, economic. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, nickel, which is falling. Tin is steady. Ferro vanadium is not a nice looking chart, is it? And zinc is rising. Yeah, but I'd say on balance, a fairly negative week. Yeah, I would think so. Um, aluminium and zinc up, everything else off. Yeah. So looking at precious metals, it's not been a great week for uh, either gold or silver. Gold down 3.2%. Slightly up on the year, central banks' uh, purchase of gold has, has slowed down a little bit after last year, or well, quite a lot after last year, actually. And official gold holdings are estimated to have hit a new record of 38,700 tonnes. Yeah, so they've slowed down buying, but still they hold a hell of a lot of it. Yeah. You know, and... Given that you know, the US has seized all the Russia's uh, US treasuries, you know, if you're going to hold reserves, gold seems a pretty good place to hold them. You don't want to hold them in US treasuries, really, do you? Actually, actually I think you do. If you're, <laughs> I, I need somebody to be buying yeah, US they treasuries. Don't go out and buy US treasuries. Yeah, exactly. I agree. <laughs> and uh, silver down one point, more two percent for the week, and down six percent for the year. And platinum. Doesn't look very healthy. Mm. Rhodium just doesn't seem to have much of a, a, a price chart at all at the moment. Yeah, this uh, seems totally dead. Yeah, uh, palladium is uh, hovering around its year lows, although five percent, well, down thirty percent for the year. I think is the most relevant yeah. you can say on that. Yeah, agreed. Okay, and on to interest rates. And frankly, it was an absolutely shocking week. Um, so the blue line is the UK yield curve, and that shifted substantially up over the past month, but particularly in the last couple of weeks, and today was a really bad day. And the same is true for the US, where we had a big, enormous shift up in the yield curve over the past month. So interest rates, as across the yield curve, across durations, 
really rising. And that means that financial conditions are tightening. Now, I'd like your input on this, Richard. So today I was talking to our mutual friend in the US and we both have big bond positions and we have both got royally stuffed. Now, we were discussing why we thought the bond yields had risen so much and neither of us believe the popular explanations which we don't think fits fit with the timeline so the popular explanation is that economic data has been surprisingly resilient which it has but it's been resilient for most of the last year not just the last couple of months and actually over the last couple of months the data has shown clear signs of weakening in the US, particularly in the form of the US payrolls and the job and openings, but also the PMIs, in particular service PMIs, have come off quite sharply. So we don't really buy that argument. Rising inflation expectations. Well, as we showed you earlier, inflation in the US is really subdued. There's not much of it. And when people talk about rising um, medium term inflation expectations, well, you back that out of the bond price. So that's a circular argument. Uh, the belief that the Fed will be higher for longer, but yeah, but only for a couple of months longer. There's still market is expecting the US to start cutting rates in July next year. That does not explain why there's been a huge sell off in the US 30 year. And finally, Treasury issuance. Well, as we showed you the chart earlier, yes, the US Treasury is issuing enormous amounts of new T-bills. But the reality is that there has been enough demand. If you look at the balance of all the Treasury auctions, they've all been oversubscribed. Treasuries are finding buyers. So we were postulating that none of the popular explanations for the bond sell-off really makes sense and a lot of it um smacks of uh, post rationalization people trying to rationalize why the bond yield has gone up as opposed to explaining why it's gone up now this is jp morgan and they're saying the rise in recent bond uh, yields has been a result of policy and growth expectations. Well, yeah, where does that come from? Who thinks growth expectations have shot up over the last month? I just don't think that's true. And this is purchases of treasuries. And you can see that actually pension funds and households have stepped up their buying of US treasuries because the yields are very attractive compared to you know alternatives. And the blue line is household holdings of treasuries. The uh, tan line is pension funds. The Fed has been cutting its um, holdings. And actually, foreigners, despite everything you read, have not actually been dumping all their treasuries. Mm. But there has been a big rise in the 10-year yield and... That's not reflected in 10-year inflation expectations. So people are demanding higher yields to um, uh, invest in U.S. Treasuries. But, you know, that is an artifact of the fall in bond prices and the rise in yields. You can't say which comes, you know, what is responsible for that. The Fed, though, is selling down its bond holdings. Now. For our explanation, I would like to remind everyone of the gilts crisis in the UK and liability-driven investments, which you remember were caused the gilt death spiral doom loop back in October 2022. Now, what are they? Well, essentially, pension funds in the UK were underfunded. They had known long-term liabilities so what they did is they geared themselves up buying gilts 
to match their their liabilities long term. So if you imagine this is a pension fund, they have 10 million pounds worth of guilt exposure, but they're backing that with only two and a half million pounds worth of cash in the form of gilts. And they have a leverage of four times. So reminder, what pension funds were trying to do is use leverage to uh, make up for the lack of returns in low interest in the low interest rate environment as was. Now, the trouble begins if gilts fall. And therefore, if there is a fall in the value of your LDI, mark to market, you're responsible for those losses and the value of your collateral is marked down by the same amount. And therefore, your gearing goes up. And if your gearing goes above a fixed level, let's say six, six times, then you have to stump up more collateral or you have to reduce the the size of your um, LDI fund. And what was happening in the gilt doom loop was that gilts were selling off so fast that in order to meet margin calls, pension funds were selling their most liquid assets. The most liquid assets were gilts, and that created a doom loop. As they sold gilt, that forced down the value of their their gilt fund, which caused further losses and they needed to stump up more margin. Now, how does that relate to the US Treasury sell-off? Well, we'd observe that this has all started in the final quarter of the US financial year to the end of September. And the sell-off in gilts will have caused, has been really sharp, and will have caused a lot of losses to somebody. And this sell-off in um, U.S. Treasuries, which is causing a sell-off in yields around the world, has all the hallmarks of a forced seller. It's going on relentlessly, and it just does not make sense. All the uh, arguments I've heard just don't make sense. They they smack of post-rationalization. And the bad news is that... It's pro- if that's the explanation, it's probably not over, but we could be at the end of it because tomorrow is the last day of the US financial year, the end of this quarter. And if it's j- driven by rebalancing, then that may, you know, hopefully be the end of it. But it's certainly been extraordinarily sharp. Mm. So if you look at global bond yields, they've risen incredibly quickly that causes enormous financial stress anyone with leverage positions just gets taken out but real money continues to buy treasuries okay so this is a uk two-year risen over the last couple of days but down from its peak but the 10-year bad few days the 30-year shocking back to its peak and i've got absolutely murdered this week us 10 year this is what's causing bond yields to rise around the world everyone is competing with the us the us 10 year continues to rise that is a shocking number the speed with which it's risen since the 1st of august you know really amazing you know it's not it's risen by the best part of 1% in the last 4 months just shocking that causes a lot of financial stress we are waiting to find out who's been swimming naked essentially and as we discussed earlier bonds now offer much higher income than equities this is the german 10-year shocking that trend can't continue italian look at that Italian worries about Italy, Italy's fiscal deficit are back. The 2024 forecast is forecast at four and a half percent. So the 2024 deficit is forecast at four and a half percent. And this is Greek. Not looking clever, any of them. 
Mm. Any change to your views, Richard? Uh, not, not really. But I mean, obviously, the, the sell-off in bonds um, does give one pause to to wonder what's happening, doesn't it? Yeah. I think your explanation, well, not your explanation, your coverage just now, Keith, is very interesting. And I agree, completely agree with you in terms of all the all the sort of explanations that have come out that don't really appear to hold water. Um, so I guess probably not. I, I, mean, I don't think bond yields are, like, are likely to go up very much more from here. But if there's something going on beneath the surface that we don't know about, um, mm. yeah, uh, the whole financial system is so stretched by this huge indebtedness that it's hard to, hard to know if something might break and if it breaks when it might break and what the consequences would be. Thank you, Richard. Well, concluding comments. Well, we are now at the end of the third quarter, and I think the fourth quarter is going to be absolutely crucial. So there are a lot of unanswered questions that I think we're going to get answers for in Q4. So will US earnings continue to grow? We've probably had a decent enough Q3, but people are expecting a bottom in US earnings in Q4 and then earnings to start rising again next year. And I see absolutely no reason for that optimism. Will the US economy bounce despite high interest rates and falling PMIs? Again, the market is expecting that, and I just can't see any evidence for it. And so far this year, we know that the US economy has been supported by the huge and unexpectedly large US fiscal deficit. Now, we have talked about over the last few weeks how the deficit is probably been exaggerated by deferred tax payments in California, Georgia, and Alabama. And we also know that student loan repayments start from the 1st of October. All of that should mean much better US tax revenues, but we don't know to the extent to which the deficit will start to come in. So that is the big question for me. How much will the US deficit shrink over the next quarter, if it will at all? And we also know that the um, US government is due to go into another shutdown unless they get a deal in the next few days. And finally, will the bond sell off abate? The bond coat yields can't keep rising forever because that tightens financial conditions. And I find this... Um, the timing of this bond um, self when growth is slowing and inflation is coming down, just mystifying. Okay, Richard, how have you been? So I have uh, suffered a little bit this week with the sell-off in precious metals. I think the sell-off in precious metals has been a consequence of the rise in bond rates. And um, But what I would say is that bond rates have gone up interest rate government bond rates have gone up from you know somewhere between 0.5 percent to ish to four percent four and a half percent whatever and in that period of time precious metals prices have risen so i think it's a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction and that in fact that precious metal prices will continue to rise so i'm just sitting on my hands that's my rationale obviously the price of uranium is beneficial to my uranium stocks um and again i am sitting on them so i have uh, have done nothing nothing this week how about you keith well i had another terrible week and frankly it's probably worse than this i don't think the uh, my pnl includes the bond yield moves today so this is as of tonight but i'm i'm skeptical i think it's worse than that um so that puts me down 15% for the year which is terrible and honestly um cause of immense anxiety um mm. I don't think I've been this stressed out and obsessing about the markets since uh, the great financial crisis. You know, I've gone too big too early. Not much fun, really. Um, I've got it terribly wrong. Now, one thing I did do was I sold my gold because I had about 5% in the portfolio. And bottom line is that that rise in bond yields and the rise in the dollar, you know, um, the carrying cost of holding gold just goes through, goes up as interest rates rise. And frankly, I think bonds are um, now offer you um, 
five percent you know and so that's over one percent real plus three and one and a half percent real plus three and a half percent inflation for the next 30 years in the uk and frankly i think that's a superior investment so i have sold my gold i have not bought more bonds yet but uh, i'm intending to if my nerves will take it um okay let's talk about something else so um you may have seen in the news that Azerbaijan launched a sneaky attack on Nagorno-Karabakh, reclaiming this part of Azerbaijan from the ethnic Armenians. And the company we have talked about a few times is Anglo-Asian Mining, which has operations in Azerbaijan. And they've previously been exploiting um mines in areas that azerbaijanis had reclaimed from armenia and presumably this will give them some more opportunities so something to think about for the next few years bottom line is though it takes years to exploit those opportunities so it's a medium term um thought and this is ithaca energy which has had the Rosebank oil field green lighted with its uh, partner Equinor, and they will cost $3.8 billion to develop the field. But 91% of that can be reclaimed. Remember, there's the um, offset against uh, revenues. So the um, reminder that profits are taxed at 75%. So yeah, this is a this is found years ago. I just don't think that there's going to be much exploration in the North Sea while we uh, tax the production at seventy five percent. And finally, a company we talked about back in the day, Independent Oil and Gas. I did a share talk on it. I sold out back in May twenty twenty two, and it has been a total catastrophe. It was the shares were suspended today. Reminder, what it did was it uh, aimed to exploit some uh, orphan gas fields in the southern North Sea offshore Norfolk. And the trouble is that it it was using fracking technology on these fields. And it turns out something to remember that fracking subsea may not be a good idea because they were getting water ingress into the fracks and that meant there's no pressure differential between the field and your um, tube where you've inserted into the field to extract the gas and that means the gas just doesn't come out so um, the Southwark field was disappointing and subcommercial uncommercial and bottom line they've essentially gone bust so that is the danger of um, investing in small oil companies looking at marginal fields okay that's it end of the third quarter next week it's the final quarter and i think it could be interesting and exciting. So stay tuned. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Please, can you press like and subscribe to the channel? And it's goodbye from Richard Wheater. And just as a little aside, may you be cursed by it living in interesting and exciting times. <laughs> it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Yeah, well, I certainly am feeling a bit cursed at the moment anyway. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. 
Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.